Justin read a powerful passage this morning. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. And in it it says, My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in the dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. The topic this morning is, is it Jesus? Would we know him if we met him? Of course, when we think about Christ and when I received my first invitation to come to know Christ, you know, of course, I was coming to know a historically known person. Think of Jesus, you think about him born in a manger, you think about him living a, a life in Bethlehem, being known as the Nazarene, and there's all these historical figures about Jesus, and these 12 men had a definite experience with him and definite impression of him. And then, of course, you think about Jesus in front of the court, the Sanhedrin, and uh, and you think about Jesus and his terrible uh, suffering and, of course, dying for us on the cross. So a lot of images come to your mind, you know, when you think about Jesus. But my understanding of the Scripture is that God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, and this passage that Justin read seems to indicate that, you know, it wasn't anything about his body or his person that would have attracted us to him. And I think that's true. And if Jesus came today, would you know who he was? I mean, if it wasn't associated with all the historical things that we've come to know Jesus by, how would you know it was Jesus? Would you recognize him? And if God is a spirit, you see, I think that God has personality like we have personality. That the same complex powers of personality that constitute personality in you and I exist in God except to an infinitely greater degree. He thinks, he feels, he touches, he sees, he hears. He says his spirit moves. And uh, the same things that we have come to understand as personality, I think, exist in the Lord. And there seems to be plenty of scriptural evidence to indicate that. He's grieved. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, that he, that he, that he, gets anguished by behaviors that we do again and again that, in fact, we can even anger God. There seems to be plenty of evidence in the Scripture and that He's loving, of course, and sacrificial. And So how would we recognize Jesus if He came today? Because when I pray, you know, I'm not looking at a body. You know, when I, if I want to get closer to Roy, Roy, I know where you live now. You know, I can go over there and we can sit down in your living room and take a look out at that pretty field out there and talk about where the where where the deer come through and look at that awesome workshop and you know I really get a sense of who you are just because I can be around you and see what you do and handle and touch the things that you touch and, and that's the way we get closer to somebody. But when I go to Jesus in prayer, I don't have a literal person that I can touch. I don't have a body that I can get near to. I don't have habits and, and, and continual behaviors that I can do with Jesus by seeing that He likes to do that, to draw closer to Him. So how do I know who Jesus is? How do I recognize Jesus? We say we want to be like Jesus. Well, what does that mean to be like Jesus? Who is Jesus? Would we recognize Him if we saw Him when we're praying? Are we praying to some image in our mind, which is not prayer? Or are we really open to the Spirit of God letting the true and living God 
speak to our hearts? That's a big question. I know a lot of people that utter a lot of words, but they, they're bouncing them off the wall. I'm not sure that they're open to the true and the living God. And, and it's not the image that I have in my mind of God when they speak of Him. Who is God? How would we recognize Jesus? Point number one. Jesus is holy. Absolutely holy in every description of Him, about Him, in all of the Scriptures. He is spoken of as virtuous, truthful, honest, pure, clean, altogether good, spotless, without blemish, holy. A lot of times when I'm praying, if I, if I start to go down to my knees and I got some sort of flippant attitude, then I know right away I need to clean up from the heart up before I even start talking to Jesus because He's holy. Because to enter His presence, I'm entering the presence of, of He who is above all that I can ask or think. He who is so pure and spotless that to approach Him, you know, the angels cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And if they do that, then shouldn't I? So I'm confronted first and foremost that throughout the Scripture and all the experiences that I have with Him, that Jesus is holy. So if I'm trying to be closer to Him, if I want to hang out with Jesus, if I want Jesus to hang out with me, if I want to be a friend of God and have God be a friend of me, then, you know, like Roy and I hang out, we do similar things together. Then I ought to try to do what Jesus does. Hey, Lord, let's do that thing that you like to do. How do you practice holiness? Well, first of all, I'm not holy. He is holy. So i got to have Him in me because I can't do it without Him. I need His holiness to be in my heart so that He can live that characteristic that's absolutely beyond my broken, flawed human condition. That's called restoration. That's called regeneration. That's called revival. That's called replenishment. That's called restoration. That's what Jesus does in a heart. So I need for the Lord to produce that same holiness in me. Who is Jesus? If I got around Him today, there might be a lot of things I don't know about Him, but I'm sure that He would be holy. That he would be good. So how do I practice that characteristic with Jesus? It's called personal purity. Oh boy. Most of the time I'm so stained and flawed. And so impure and so far back from where I should be. That every time I look at Jesus. All I see is my own impurity. You know the closer you get to the light of holiness. The closer you get to that cleansing searchlight that's altogether true, the more your untruths and stains and blemishes become clear. The closer I get to Jesus, the more I realize I need to be like Him. But I can work on it. I may not be there today, but I can know that to hang out with the Lord, I need this standard this nature of personal purity that God has. And Lord, I can't do it without you, so would you produce that quality that only you have in me? I'm sure if I saw and met Jesus today on the street, then he would be pure. Hebrews 7.26 says, For it was fitting for us to have a high priest who was holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has a holy nature. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is holy. Second thing about Jesus that I know without a question, if I met him, he's true. No falsehoods ever came from the Lord. The Lord never told a lie about anything. Everything He said was true, even when others accused Him of something other than the truth. 
They were made to be liars because the Lord always spoke the truth. And when we get right down to it, Jesus confronts us with our own lives, with our, with our own lies, with our own half truths, with our own propensities for weakness and for faith. And the closer I get to Jesus, the more this standard of truth, and I'm not talking about, oh, I'm so good, da, 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 da. That's not truth. That's a lie. <laughs> truth is this holiness, this sweet nature of Jesus, this, this propensity, this chain of obedience that wants to honor God living in me because I truly am drawing closer to Him and learning that nature of truth that only Jesus can teach me. Complete candor. I believe that's one thing if I met the Lord that I'd sense. There's not an untruth in Him. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And that truth is Jesus. John chapter 14 verse 6 said, Jesus said, I'm the way and I am the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Another thing, you know, the Lord, when, when He was alive then, He spoke in a different way than the leaders around Him. You could recognize right away that it was Jesus because of His authority. You know, He spoke as one with authority. It wasn't, well, so-and-so said, or so-and-so said, or so-and-so said. He did refer to the Old Testament. He was quite reverent in terms of the, the Scriptures. But He spoke as one with authority with absolute conviction, and the conviction came from inside Him. And most of the times that I'm drawing closer to Christ and I really feel Him, I'm absolutely convinced. I'm a convinced friend. I'm a convinced Quaker. I wasn't born birthright as a Quaker. I became convinced that it was the right way to believe, that I could have this personal union with God, that it was no more or no less than anyone else could have. You could also have your personal relationship with God, which made me on an equal footing with you. You have a calling equal to mine. I have a calling equal to yours. We're both called. We have our individual callings from God. They're very important. And if a correct perspective is that I'm whole, I'm right, I'm okay with Him and He can live in me, but He can do the same for you. Which means if we're on the same ground with God, we can be on the same ground with each other. And whether you're black, yellow, green, pink, purple, red, or whatever, we have this same access to God and we should have this wonderful respect and love uh, and cherishment for each other as sentient beings made in the sight of God. Authority. It comes when I'm plugged into God. Fox had it. You know, when Fox got his information, he got it straight from the Almighty. He didn't have to ask people anymore. He knew because God told him. Matthew 7 verse 29 says that Jesus spoke as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. That was New International Version. New Living Translation says, For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. And we already said that Jesus was holy, but we were talking about His personal nature. I believe another way that we would know that it's Jesus if we confronted Him today is that we would see another kind of holiness, a reverence for the Father. In everything that Jesus did in His earthly life, He pointed to His heavenly Father. He did say that I and the Father are one, and if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But He was always pointing to the Father. You know, and we'll always have this reverent disposition for God. There is a God, and I'm not Him. And I'm always pointing to the Lord. People will say good things about me, and I'll say, praise God, thank you, Jesus. Because I know I couldn't do it without Him. And if Christ lives within us, then we'll have this reverence Towards the heavenly father. You know when Jesus came the answer. The angel came. And told Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the most high will overshadow you. And for that reason the holy child shall be called the son of God. Holiness because he came from the father. Holiness because the father's nature is in him. And can be in us. 
Something else I know we would recognize about Jesus is His conviction. I love Him and the Lord accepts me and the Lord loves me and He loves you and He accepts you. But He always leaves us feeling we need to be more like Him. There's this convicting power. The woman at the well, He didn't judge her, but don't say no more. God always leaves us with this message of what we can do to be more like Him. And that if we love Him, we will be more like Him. He convicts us of those things that's out of step with Him. That's out of touch with His reality. And He causes us and calls us to be more like Him. John 2.25 says, Because He did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for He Himself knew what was in man. God will convict you because He sees in your heart. He knows absolutely who you are. You may fool everybody else, but you won't fool God. He knows exactly who you are inside out, upside downs, backwards, forwards, and sideways. You get along with your maker and he already knows sometimes I'm going to prayer and I don't feel like I can say much. I'm too exhausted or I'm too fatigued or something. And I know it's okay because he knows what's in my heart. I tried to do a video this past week and my eyes were so tired I couldn't hold them open. (laughs) But God knew my heart. You know, and we need to understand that this one with whom we have to do knows everything about us. We're always naked with him with whom we have to do. We're always open and manifest where I'm like a blank sheet of music. He reads me all the way each day and he does you too. That's the God that we serve. John chapter 16 verse 8 says, And when he comes... He will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. I drive my karate students crazy. Is it ever good enough? (laughs) I do praise you, don't I? Yeah. I do compliment you, don't I? But is is it ever good enough? Nope. There's always a little better you can do. And I'll tell you about it. And when I'm with the Lord, I feel that way. It he loves me and He cares about me and He's glad for the good things that I, I can do. But you know, you, you could tweak that right there and it would be a lot nicer. <laughs> Don tries to say that to me all the time. Well, you could have said that a little differently or maybe you could have not said that at all. We always need tweaking. We always need fine-tuning. We always need that careful touch and And Jesus' whole purpose for coming is to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment, says in John 16, 8. He wants to make known to us those things that are out of step, out of touch, out of step with his highest reality. Jesus is a discerner of the hearts of men. Don, I know you're into that business big time in counseling. You have to discern to see to know, to understand, to read, to ascribe properly the inside qualities of a person to be able to help them. And Jesus is a discerner of our heart. He knows what's really going on with us and how to get to us and to help us be what we should be. Matthew chapter 22, verses 19 through 21 says, Hear! Show me the coin used for the tax. And when they handed him a Roman coin, he said, whose picture and title is stamped on this? And they said, Caesar's. He said, well then, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. I was looking for a coin. I don't have one. But they were trying to trip him up. You know, they wanted to say, say, have him say something that either got him in trouble with the legal authorities or got him in trouble with the spiritual rulers. So Jesus was wise. Who, you know, did he owe the tax? He said, give what belongs to men to men and what belongs to God to God. And he showed them their own, showed them their own piece of money. Well, I tell you what, when you look at a human being, there's part of us that we have to give to men, right? But when I look at me, primarily I see the image of God made in his image. 
And fully and totally, I belong to God. And I give myself primarily and totally to Him. One thing also Jesus would be is spiritual. He would not be of this world. He would say a message. He would speak a truth. He would be of a different disposition, demeanor, attitude, and general uh, characteristic than the world around Him. Jesus would never sound like just what the world around Him was saying. So if you were trying to do the popular thing, you probably wouldn't follow Jesus because what He's saying would sound a little different. You know, we don't understand this because our world's consumed by it. But popularity is completely and totally irrelevant to the true child of God. It matters not at all. Zero. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God. I'm not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. If I fast twice a week, I'd give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat on his chest saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, that sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Your popularity matters not to the Almighty. He's not looking for what's your social position. He could care less. Zero, in fact. His message won't be the message of the world. It'll be something different. And certainly he would be divine. Jesus evidenced in his own life in so many ways that he was the true son of God. And a lot of people say, well, Jesus never really came out and said, I'm God. Well, how about this? This sounds close enough to me. John 6.35, I'm the bread of life. John 8.12, I'm the light of the world. John 10.9, I am the door. John 10, chapter 10, 11 and 14, verse 11 and 14, I am the good shepherd. John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John chapter 15, verses 1 and 5, I am the vine. Well, <laughs> you say what you want to say. I think Jesus knew who he was. And I don't think you could be around him without realizing that he is God. It's all over him. He healed the sick, raised the dead, turned the water into wine, walked on the water, turned the fishes into loaves and, and the water into wine. This Jesus was a miracle worker. And if we saw Him today, miracles would be following. And as His followers, miracles should follow us. They did fox. I can't keep up with all the little miracles happening around me. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Don't, God don't draw a crowd and stand on the corner. That ain't the way the Lord does it. Oftentimes, you got to be looking. It'll be plain. It'll be known. And you can see that it was God. But He's not got a bullhorn out there saying, I'm going to do a miracle now. <laughs> and certainly, Jesus would have a calling. And He'd have a calling for you. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, it wasn't that Jesus wanted him to sacrifice. That wasn't the deal. He wanted him to follow him. And here's what it costs you to follow Jesus. Whatever you got. Always. All of it. Me, you, us, all of us. Anything you put in front of Jesus, give it up. Because He wants to be first in your life. And that's your calling. Matthew 4.19, He said, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Mark 1.16-20 And He was going along by the Sea of Galilee, and He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net on the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to me, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed Him. It's His will, not our program. 
His will, not our will. Always. You can't come to God and say, well, how about we alter it a little bit this way? He'll say, leave that right there and you come follow me. To all of us. That's always the call of Jesus. There's so much that I can say about Jesus. I think I'm going to pick up next week and talk about things that will be in your life if you're a follower of Jesus. I want to read this little poem first and ending our message this morning. Probably read it again next week. I wrote this last night about 3 o'clock in the morning. Is it Jesus would we know? Is it His voice? Does it make the bells on the mountains toll? Does it make the waves of the great sea roll? Does it cause the dead to raise? Can it brighten the day like the sun's sweet rays? Can it speak to nothing and speak it into being? Can it put salve in blinded eyes and cause them to start seeing? Does it make the mighty tremble? Does it make the weak leap for joy? Does it make the frightened find the parts of courage to assemble? Does it make the alone and homeless feel assured, assured and blessed? Does it make the quivering at peace and sing songs of victory that chases off the burdens claimed by all the rest? Does it appear both stronger than the great beast in the wild and yet lowlier and meek than the meekest, mildest child? Does it make the lame to walk? Does it make the blind to see? Does it lift the darkest hole and certainly set the helpless captive free? Does he cause the sheep to lay down in sweet pasture fret free, yet cause the wolf to run quivering away and the ravenous lion to flee? Does it ring of bells of joy even in the darkest dreary cavern deep? Does it cause strength and courage in the faintest heart when trouble makes it hard to sleep? Does it rain sweet love and peace when dread and gloom has had its way? Can it comfort the most broken heart that has been so very lost and deeply astray? Then it's probably Jesus.